Welcome to a new series of Therapy and Theology. The title of this one is one of my favorites. Let's stop avoiding this conversation. Six topics women have big questions about. Today is episode one, and we're specifically focusing in episode one on why it doesn't help anyone for a woman to be devalued. So welcome, guys. This Good is, to be here. Yeah, yeah this fun. is so fun to gather and talk about important issues today. This is Dr. Joel Mutamale with me. And then, of course, we have Jim Cress, licensed professional counselor with a whole bunch of other degrees behind his name. I always joke and say that Joel brings the theology, Jim brings the therapy, and I bring the questions and issues. So you're welcome. You're so honest about that. Yes, yes. So why is therapy and theology needed? And specifically, why is a series devoted to women um, important for us to cover. I think it's important to bring the therapy and the theology because you deserve good answers, both spiritually and emotionally. And so we're going to definitely tackle that from these questions. We're going to tackle it from both of those important perspectives and lenses. And of course, you know that therapy and theology is part of Proverbs 31 Ministries, and Proverbs 31 Ministries exists for women to know the truth and live the truth, because when they do, it changes everything. So the purpose of this entire podcast, not just this series, is not to give specific personalized advice to individuals. This should not take place of going to see a licensed professional counselor that can help you navigate the nuances of your relationships, your issues, your past, all of that. Um, But rather, we want to provide a safe place to talk about real things that you may be facing, provide therapeutic and theological There you go. Theological wisdom. So you can be empowered to seek out the help and healing you may need. And Mm -hmm. just on a personal note, I will say that incorporating the therapeutic wisdom of Jim and the theological wisdom of Joel has tremendously helped me in my own healing journey. So thank you both. And I'm so excited to share you with the world. So Jim and Joel, what are some of the challenges that you see women facing in ever increasing measures right now? Jim, we'll start with you. Yeah, we are in several really different pandemics. There is a global COVID pandemic, Uh, that is going on. And no matter when this series is watched, who knows when it really ends that pandemic. We're also, we've talked about this as a whole nother topic and yay, one topic that's coming up, which is on a porn-demic. The pornography rates uh, were already bad enough, but skyrocketed during um, during COVID and the pandemic and the impact, especially since what this series is about on women. Mm -hmm. I don't think we know yet how Mm -hmm. bad it is. And then, of course, we're in truly... Uh, look around, we're in a global mental health pandemic. So these mental health issues have come to the surface. And I could list off, I won't, but a myriad of, like, big one I saw in the counseling office was everybody went home. You up in my space right now. I mean, like I said, you need social distancing at home. So I felt like, whoa, where do I get my space rather rather organically? But then there's the reality of Uh, Just the major life change and shift that these things, like Proverbs 20, verse 5 says, the purposes in our hearts are deep waters, so we go down deep to draw them out. These I watch things just become uh, buoyant, and they begin to come up to the surface, and people are like, what's going on? Well, it's just, I think a lot of what's going on is the environment, and we couldn't keep certain things at bay, and a lot of us were scared, anxiety issues uh, around a pandemic huge, like, I can't control this. And as we've said too many times, the brain is wired for confidence and knowing. So everybody's afraid of, well, what's coming next? You can't prove, you can't really predict what is coming next. And I think part of that is going to be, too, the idea of we say that people are down on what they're not up on. We can read all we want on the internet and learn, but there's a sense of, I've never, it's ahistorical, I've never been through this before. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Well, I remember, of course, we're recording this in the latter months yeah, of 2022, <laughs> and who would have thought at this point that we would still be referencing yeah. mm-hmm. COVID-19 and all of mm-hmm. that, and that's not where we're going today. But what I do want to focus in on is we're very much seeing a severe uptick in mental health issues and emotional trauma, mm-hmm. and I remember, Jim, when... Uh, just probably when the pandemic was first starting, I was asking you, why are we seeing such a a rise in the numbers of women Mm -hmm. um, being devastated in their marriages or in women really suffering and their suffering seems more apparent. And I remember you looking at me and saying, well, Lisa, they are spending so much time at home, they're forced to see some issues. It's like draining the lake, and then you really see what's there. Mm-hmm. Whereas busyness and uh, busier routines were definitely helping to make at least it less likely that we had to face some really tough things, but now we're facing them. Well, that busyness is a proven, believe it or not, because I, I admit I struggle with my own anxiety issues. Mm-hmm. I, I do. I'm not afraid of that, and I have the resources and resiliency to deal with it. Anxiety, don't worry about it. Just get resilient, get the resources to deal with it. And what happens is when I'm there, like you say, everybody going home and facing this is – The busyness is a major distraction. It's like I say you're water skiing on top of that lake, the pandemic or other things happen, and suddenly you let go of the rope and you're just sinking down in the water that's been there the entire time, and that's what that pandemic did. It's there, been there the whole time. And I think also now busyness has kicked back in. So now we're dealing with the stresses of not being able to unsee what we see or what we saw And um, the stresses and strains of returning back to busier schedules is placed on top of Mm -hmm. these emotional traumas that we have to deal with. So, you know, I think 10 or 15 years ago, I don't ever remember me or my friends discussing hard topics around Mm -hmm. emotional trauma and mental health issues such as narcissism, gaslighting, codependency, and even emotional abuse, mm-hmm. um, a couple other words, triggers, addictions. We just didn't talk about those things because maybe we didn't have the language to, or maybe it seemed like topics that were reserved for psychological settings, not everyday carpool That's lines. Well put. Right. Yeah. But now I feel like people are starting to become very aware um, of these topics. And not just in our Christian circles, they're becoming aware everywhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we didn't have the language before to talk about it, and now we are more hyper-aware that it exists. But it's, I think, being more talked about because we're becoming more aware that there are more and more toxic relationships. Mm -hmm. And being able to talk about it or have the nomenclature to name those problems, we all know this doesn't mean I have the resources and tools, as St. Paul would say, to go put into practice. I just am more informed. Sometimes that's worse. What do I do with all this information I have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I remember one time you were saying to me, you know, I really questioned, why weren't we talking about these before? And Mm -hmm. why am I now 53 years old, and I'm just now getting educated of how to even have the vocabulary to have discussions around this or to even name the real issues that exist. And I remember you saying, Jim, Lisa, you need to give yourself some grace because when you know better, Mm -hmm. you will do better. better. Mm -hmm. And I really agree with that statement. I think issues around mental health are both enlightening and very challenging. But also for me, I'm seeing so many women my age facing the shock of an unknown future because Mm -hmm. some relationships aren't making it. Mm -hmm. Some relationships have become unsustainable because of of the level of toxicity in those relationships. And I'm seeing more than ever, maybe it's because of my personal story or maybe just the numbers are higher. I don't know. But I'm hearing from more and more women my age and and of all ages, really, facing unwanted divorces. So part of the challenge that we're also facing with the mental health crisis is our own heartbreak. You know, it's not just past trauma now. Mm -hmm. We're experiencing current trauma. And certainly when you walk through 
a severe relationship issue, there's going to be a lot of heartbreak, and it's really going to make some of those emotional issues, maybe even mental health issues, even Mm -hmm. more apparent and hard to deal with because you're compounding it. But an equally challenging thing to navigate is the lack of theological awareness when it comes to the Christian's response to separation, to relationships falling apart, and specifically to divorce. Mm. Many people say extremely hurtful things because I think it's assumed that Christians will make sure that all relationships last for all time. But we don't even see that with relationships in the Bible, so I don't know why we would think that we would see it in today's everyday life, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say hurtful things either because they don't know what to say or they feel compelled to defend God's Word. The problem is, if we are violating God's Word in an effort to defend God's Word, we're not really honoring God's word mm-hmm. as it was intended. So when when people weaponize verses around these hard topics, hoping others won't catch divorce fever or mm-hmm. you know toxic relationship fever or whatever it is, it's just a mass of women out there that are needing answers. I don't see a mass of women out there so eager to lose relationships. I don't see a mass of women so eager to divorce their husbands. I don't see a mass of women out there looking for the easy way out Mm -hmm. to family members. I don't see them trying to peace out or tap out. I'm sure those situations exist. But what I see is women who need therapeutic and theological help to navigate not only the mental health issues that are being talked about today, but also the personal things we're facing that are compounding the mental and emotional challenges we're facing, and that is heartbreak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so good, Lisa. And I just, to build some bridges, I think historically, we've always thought about um, emotional and physical health as one compartmentalized category right? And then all of a sudden there is theological or spiritual health in a different category. And yet the biblical vision of a human is not a demarcation of these these different categories. God created us as whole human beings with physical, spiritual, and emotional all combined together. Uh, And so it's vitally important that we understand that our spiritual health directly impacts our emotional, which flows into our physical, and it is a circle um, that changes in different seasons. And um, one of the things that I've been so intrigued by is in a society where we have more and more information, it's what you said earlier, Mm -hmm. Jim, in a society that has more and more information, it's not surprising for me that anxiety is on the rise. And here's why. I actually think that the more information that we have could potentially be destructive for us and actually destabilizing for us if we don't know how to think about the information, if we don't know how to connect this information with how God intends for us to rightly view it. And so, Lisa, like what you're talking about when it comes to um, women and how they understand their identity and their value and their worth and, and, and biblical institutions like marriage, for me, one of the things that keeps coming up is what appears to be a disconnect between what the Bible actually says about the dignity specifically of women and then the heartache, you were just describing it, the heartache around what the personal experience has been in this area. So some of this, the discussion has been around if, for question like, do women actually have value and worth in and of themselves? Or... Is their value and worth only connected to their identity, their role, their um, functioning as a woman, as a wife, as a as a mother in their work or in their vocation, um, who they are in social settings? Like this is creating a bit of confusion. It it, cre- it makes you feel unstable. Another thing I've seen is a uh, misuse which turns into misunderstanding, which eventually flows into misapplication of yeah. scriptures when it comes to biblical concepts and ideals like marriage or work, vocation, being a mom. You see, there's a, a real danger 
of women being hurt, confused, or living in the tension of being told to live up to the ideal of a biblical institution. We can talk about marriage, for example, while those people who are asking them to do this, and we'll get into this later, actually miss God's heartbeat for the person who, uh, the people who are within this actual relationship. So for me, one of the most important things for us in our time together is to think rightly about the scriptures and have a holistic view of God's ideal of what it means to be a a woman made in the image Mm -hmm. and likeness of God. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing, I love the way you phrased all of that, and not only God's heartbeat, but also look at the life of Jesus. I call it the Jesus context. Mm -hmm. And how did Jesus interact with and treat women that were in very challenging situations. Um, And even though the Bible is probably not going to identify specifically certain terminology of mental health issues, but they were there. There was emotional heartbreak. There was betrayal. There was rejection. There was treating women like an outcast or even treating women as subhuman Mm -hmm. and, and giving women no rights to to speak up and no ability to process what they were going through because the social standards at the time required women just to stay quiet. To stay quiet. And fulfill their roles. And their value was in the fulfillment of the roles that they played. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to go there. I want to talk about mm. some of these verses that have been weaponized. And Jim, I would love for you to add in Mm -hmm. anything from the therapeutic standpoint that you're noticing and what really happens. And maybe let's start with this question to you, Jim. What really happens when a woman is devalued or a person is devalued over and over and over inside of her personal relationships, in the social context, and just the overall feeling Mm. that this is right, not because it feels right, but because everyone is doing it? Well, sadly, maybe most importantly for me uh, of what I see is for that precious woman to start believing the data, if not indeed the words or accusations, not just of the devil, but of this person that she is in a relationship with. And somehow it's like those those violent words, like a plane land and they're landing and she doesn't know what to do with them. She's maybe scratching her head saying, well, what if they're right? What if that's true? Uh, It really sets up a term we've used on this podcast many times, and I love the term. I think it sets up her to hustle for her worthiness. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I do more, sets up people-pleasing, co-dependency. It's called works righteousness in theological circles. Mm -hmm. So she begins to move and think maybe and doubt her own reality, and a classic one I've used, right? It's not original with me, but, you know, for her sometimes stress is when her gut says no, but her mouth says yes, or her gut says stop, but her mouth says go or, yeah, I'll do that. But she will begin to find and try to find, and you know, in grace and mercy, who could blame her? But she'll try to find an external solution to that internal problem. Those external voices become internal, and she starts believing that. And after a while, uh, it can be false identity, but can feel like her own identity. And I think everyone loses when a woman is devalued. Absolutely. It's not just the woman, Mm -hmm. but it is everyone that woman's life has the potential to enrich. But if she feels less than constantly, she will no longer start believing or she will no longer keep believing Mm -hmm. that she has the ability to enrich people's lives beyond what those people want her to do for them. And I'll go a step further with that, Lisa. Um, I think it also is destructive for the social structure of our human existence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Like it it is actually um, a stripping of the fabric of what keeps our society together. And women have a crucial role to play in that. Um, And so, yes, it's individual, but absolutely is it corporate and cultural. So, Joel, let's go ahead and look from a theological standpoint, where's the biblical support for this? And, And why is it important from a theological standpoint to get this right? And 
why everyone loses when a woman is devalued. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll start actually with one of uh, Jim's uh, sayings that is one of my favorite things that he says. He says that our words frame our reality. And boy, is this true emotionally, but incredibly theologically. Um, so you open up in the first couple chapters of Genesis, and, and we've here's the other danger. We've become familiar with some of these verses mm -hmm. to the point that we've allowed our modern cultural context to inform a historical biblical context. And so what I want to do is kind of take a step back and okay, just Okay, I want you to say that one more time because I really want people to hear what you just said. Yeah, at, at times when we're in the Bible, what what ends up happening is we, uh, because we get familiar with it, we can allow our modern cultural context to inform words that are rooted in a historical, biblical, and social context. So uh, two key examples. I'm going to sneak in a third potentially, uh, but one is this famous kind of, you hear it at, at weddings and, um, and engagement uh, ceremonies, but um, God made uh, a woman from Adam's what? His? Well, side. Some, some versions say side, some say rib. Right. So uh, Genesis 2, verse, we'll start in verse uh, 20. So the man gives name to all these livestock, to the birds of the sky, to every wild animal, but for the man, and we're going to get to helper later, but for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man and he slept and God took one of his, I'm reading from CSB, one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. Now, uh, some translations say rib. Some of the more um, nuanced translations are going to say side. Well, why? This is the Hebrew word salah. And uh, I was doing some word study uh, in this and Jim loves We love when you do word study, by the way. I really, uh, well, yeah, I, I no found question. something interesting, and y'all, I've been through a lot of school, you know, undergraduate, uh, MDiv, PhD, like I've done a lot of school in this area. And we love that you've done a lot of school. Yes, we do. But here's the tragic, <laughs> and I'm trying to connect some dots even, even in formal theological training that I think I need to confess and just say, I, this wasn't taught to me in my Genesis survey class, in hmm. my in-depth Genesis uh, Hebrew. So, so I'm just pointing out, if you're like, Joel, I feel so bad. Like I never, I don't want you to feel bad. I just good. want to invite you into the learning process. And mm -hmm. one of the things I learned about this Hebrew word is that it is intimately connected to the stability of an object or a person. So, mm. so Lisa, I know one of the things that you love is, um, is uh, what do we call it, renovating homes. And we had a situation in our house where we wanted to take a, w a wall down. And we asked you, hey, what do you think? And one of the first things you said was, Joel, you got to be careful. Make sure that wall isn't what? Load bearing. Load bearing, which means that there's a beam that goes up to the very top. It's a stabilizing beam. Yeah, because if that wall is load bearing, you take it down, The you must put a supporting beam, which is expensive, Super especially expensive. if you're going to get it up into the ceiling. But it is required because if not, the structure will not be stable. So think about this from an architectural standpoint. Ain't nobody thinking... Ooh, I think I'm just gonna take the risk <laughs> of not putting this up right? Yeah. Like because that could be catastrophic for, mm -hmm. for everybody inside of that home, even guests that you have in. So let's make the connection here. The the rib, and the, I'm gonna put our modern kind of understanding. A rib, like you could crack a rib, no big deal. It's gonna be super painful, but you can keep living, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but you take the side of a person that actually gives them the stability to walk and to be held together, there is no functioning. At that point, at that standpoint, this is the imagery that the biblical language, the Hebrew language is giving of the creation of woman from the side of man. And so then you have a different framework. Okay, so is it more like like a, a bigger portion of the man a, has been so. taken? I, yeah, I think so. I think it's a massive portion of the man. A I think, massive portion to the yeah. point where maybe he requires... A stabilizing force. I mean, I'm gonna. Yeah, I think that's the biblical. Now we can't go too far in the literal standpoint of it, but I think this is the the imagery that we're supposed to get, and it's super important because it establishes the value and the worth and the identity of these two people. Hmm. Right? Um, it refuses to allow one to be superior and the other inferior, because it puts the man in a position of actually uh, intimate weakness without the woman present. Mm. And so the social structure is a social structure where both are brought together in order to bring a whole. And when both are brought together and bring a whole, it brings honor and glory to God because it bears the full image of God, right? By the way, do you realize you seriously just gave a wonderful, in my opinion, description of why maybe there's so much verbal and emotional abuse that 
maybe coming from men toward women because mm. you take her away. And I talk about their sexual objectification. She's just an object, but there's emotional, relational object. I don't even certainly don't see her bearing the the imago dei, the image of God. But if I can make her just an object, like, and she doesn't have that strength coming my way. Right. I love when you said it. I thought, boy, that ties right into especially emotional abuse. That's mm-hmm. so good. And so that takes us to our next verse, uh, Genesis two, starting in verse seventeen. Actually, it, it goes after that. Verse eighteen. Then the Lord God said, and He's talking to Adam and Eve. He said, or he's talking to Adam, it is not good for man to be alone. Then he says this, I will make a helper corresponding to him. Now I'm going to again, go back to what have we done culturally with this word helper? Uh, I I did a poll. I I asked some friends and, you know, we work in a women's ministry and we asked some friends that are in the Mm -hmm. office. Like when you hear the word helper, at least what do you you think of when you hear helper? Well, before we started studying Studying this, um, I would say one who helps another with stuff that she can help with. And so my original image of this helper in the context of my life was that I need to help take care of the home. I need to be Mm -hmm. the nurturing force with my kids. Mm -hmm. I need to wash the dishes and do the laundry and run the errands and, and all of that. And I don't think any of those things are what we're not supposed to be doing. I think, though, instead of focusing on the roles that we play, I want to focus on the value. And I think we've missed the value tucked inside that word helper. And the the Hebrew word helper is ezer. And um, as we look at this word used, and so we have this thing that we talk about, Lisa, often when we're doing theological study, the law first mentions, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, This is the first time that this word is being mentioned. It's being used. It's this deeply rich Hebrew word, we need to really ask and pause and and consider, okay, if this is the first time it's used, how is it used elsewhere? What is the weight of the usage of this word? Really intriguing when I was studying this is the the overwhelming majority of the time that Ezer is used later on in scripture, it's a descriptive word to describe Yahweh, God, who is stepping in to intervene to help Israel, who is in the midst of being destroyed, typically in a military situation. So it's not a passive word at all. No, it it has militaristic overtones. It has authority. It brings stability. It's is. And I think I want to go back to that. Israel is on the verge of losing their stability. The, the Canaanites and the Philistines are about to whoop them and destroy them, mm. right? And now you have Yahweh who comes in as a stabilizing, rescuing figure to bring them out of their plight. This is the, the picture. This is the image from the very beginning, prior to the fall, we didn't even get to Genesis 3 yet, of God's ideal hmm. and heartbeat for, for a woman, for her value, for her worth. And so as we think about helper, I think it's vitally important that we connect that word helper to its natural context, biblical context. And now all of a sudden you go, wow, um, there is something sorely and really tragic and, and damaging if we don't have this person, this gender, this, this woman uh, present, not just in our personal lives, but societally in our culture. And I think it's important to, when we were looking at this together, um, I remember you saying that it's, it's not the picture of a servant rising up in a temporary fashion to suddenly help the king. It is more like an ally fellow king, king. Good, who is coming in to help support when necessary aid needs to be gotten from somewhere. Yeah. And so I think that's really important too, because again, it speaks to the value of the helper. And so I want, you know, people might just be, and I hope you are, you're like, hey, wait a minute, where did you get that that thought of an ally king? Well, Genesis 1, 26 through 27, um, it says that God made man, and that, that Hebrew word, it, it includes women, man and woman. He made them in his likeness and image. These are two Hebrew words, shalem and demut. Now, this is super intriguing again with this. These are words to describe a king who would have offspring and his children would be referred to as being in the king's likeness and image. Mm. And so again, this is the picture that is being painted of Adam and Eve together prior to the fall. They both are um, are reflections of royalty. Uh, and so, yeah, one king is about to, to fall. 
this, this stabilizing figure of equal worth and value comes in over the hills. And I just think from the Israelite standpoint, what a pleasant sight. What a breath of fresh air. What, what hope fulfilled when you think all is lost to see the Azair, the, the helper, the, the, the person who's going to bring stability and, and, uh, and help you. And, and that, I think, like regardless of where else we go in this series, mm. like if we just get this one part and aspect of God's vision for the identity and value and worth of a woman, I think it can have um, such redemptive and, and really important um, consequences for all these other aspects that we'll discuss in the coming episodes. In mm. episode two of the series, we're really going to go after emotional abuse, what is it, and how it contributes to the silencing of a woman. But Joel, before we end this one, and Jim, I want your perspective too, um, is there a place in the Bible where we see a woman described more as a valiant warrior woman, not just as a homemaker or a caretaker? And again, I'm not talking about throwing the baby out with the bathwater yeah, right. here. You know, I love being a caretaker. I love being the nurturing force in my home. Um, I actually love doing laundry. I really do. But I think my value, if I can keep my value in mind, that my value is that I am made in the image and likeness of God, the Imago Dei. And then even... And I'm going to just kind of bait you toward the answer I want you to, <laughs> to Follow give. Follow suit, please. <laughs> But even the name of our ministry, yeah. Proverbs 31, I've often heard her described as a wife of noble character. And again, I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But there's also this sense that she is a woman of valor. That's right. And I think if we only assign her value to a role, like she's a wife of noble character, then we're missing the reality that she's also a woman of valor. Yeah. And her worth is found in the valor, the woman of valor that God established her to be. So Jim, from an emotional standpoint, the women coming into your office, they're dealing with hurts, they're dealing with heartbreak, mm -hmm. they're dealing with feeling devalued, maybe in a relationship, mm -hmm. maybe in family of origin, uh, maybe in their job, maybe even in their um, calling, and they're feeling devalued. What does this do to a woman, and how could this information help her? Yeah, it's a great question, and um, you know, many places to go. One is I'm always mindful. The great book we've talked about, the body keeps the score, uh, so that in the body she can begin to develop mental health issues, stress, GI tract problems. I mean, the, the body just remembers. Mm. So inside, we call that somatic or somatizing. Like in my body, it's like I'm I may not be the woman who throws grenades, hopefully not, and but I might swallow grenades. So the impact is noticing around sleep, around so many different issues. So to pay attention what can go on there. And then in the psyche or the brain, the soul, the mind of, of beginning to believe the accusations. We know that Satan's the accuser of everyone, but to begin to believe these and internalize them and basically do something to their own mind, their own belief system, where they begin to believe lies. It's, uh, there are books written called The Lies Women Believe, and I internalize them, and suddenly the more I do that, as Aristotle would say, that we are uh, what we repeatedly do and think, really. So suddenly my operating system changes, and I've internalized these, and that's part of the problem. And I think the, the other part is it is just inside you've referenced family of origin. We've said if it's hysterical, it's historical to look, and maybe that questioning like, Maybe dad was right, because dad either sinned by omission or commission. He said these things about me, or mom did, or someone else. We always want to look in life through all of your journey, how you've been named. You dummy, you idiot, you, we could say really derogatory words, not to be funny. We won't say, you've heard them out there. So the idea is I begin to believe how I have been named. God's word tells us very clearly how, how he names us. But I'll internalize these things as though I'm living under the name of this versus in Jesus renaming Peter, you know, even mm -hmm. it's like believing these names. And of course that will flow in generations. I believe that I might 
if I don't have my own identity in Christ especially, then I can believe that. And how am I going to interact as a person, a friend, a spouse, and a mother? I think it's going to imp- it's wide-ranging impact. So, again, no one wins when a woman is devalued. No one wins. Satan and, thinks he wins for the moment. He loses in the end, but he thinks he wins. And when a woman is devalued from a psychological standpoint, a mental health standpoint, an yep. emotional health mm-hmm. standpoint, it's traumatic Very when much. a woman is devalued. Mm-hmm. Um, and also from a spiritual standpoint, mm-hmm. it is traumatic. And trauma is not something that just happens to you. It happens in you. That's right. So good. So, Joel, let's go to the woman of valor. Yeah. So Proverbs 31, um, the woman of valor. And then I want to connect us to Jesus because at the end of the day, we need to we need to really get to, did Jesus believe any of this? You know, otherwise it's not going to make any sense. But interestingly, Proverbs 31 um, is all about this valiant warrior type woman. She um, is a woman that, and so again, what we do is we take helper and we think homemaker, right? But actually the picture that, that's here is uh, a season where uh, the men have gone out to war. And that, this is the background. The men have gone off to war and now these women step in and they're handling business. They're handling budget. The way that the ancient home was run, uh, if you're handling the home, you're handling the land, you're handling the commerce that's taking place in the marketplace. I mean, these are women of status. They're women of stature. They're women that are are doing valuable, valuable mm. work. In fact, so important that the way that Proverbs 31 lays all this out, it, it actually refuses, if we read it rightly, to to locate women in a corner that says, oh, they're just a homemaker. Oh, their place is in the home. And it's not to say that those things are bad. It's just saying that those things aren't what define the woman. Mm-hmm. Those things aren't God's ideal of saying that's the only thing that brings you value and worth. And again, it goes to this militaristic picture of a valiant kind of warrior woman. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's important that we see it. By the way, maybe handling it, no fun here. I'm not trying to be funny. Maybe handling it dynamically better than the man would, because that was true in our own marriage where mm. a therapist said, well-intended, you know, you need to take the finances away from Jim. He needs to step up. My wife had the finances organized. This is all in our testimony, in our story. And I was a nightmare. To ha- I had no business handling the finances that way and her mm-hmm. gift set. But mm-hmm. maybe... The, there are men in relationship with these women who they would even feel, I know they come into my office and say the men do, if they're honest, how inadequate they feel in the presence yeah. of a woman of valor and value. That's such a good point, Jim, because then again, it's a reframing. Yeah. It's a reframing of what we understand as, oh, that's exposing my weakness to, oh my goodness, that's the helper I need. Yeah, great. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Um, but here's the thing, Lisa, that I find fascinating in Jim about Jesus is that Jesus in his earthly ministry refuses to um, to to bend to the cultural norm of what a woman's role or a woman's mm. place was going to be in a society, in an ancient culture that was known to, honestly, subjugate and, and devalue women. Jesus is subversive. <laughs> Jesus is, in a sense, lack of better words, kind of rebellious in this mm-hmm. area. He refuses to bend to anything other than the ideal of, of God the Father in it. And so there's these two stories that I think are really important. One takes place in Luke 10, 38 through 42. There's these two sisters, and we know the story. It's Mary and Martha. Martha. And it's really interesting that uh, the text tells us that that while Martha is doing, you know, all the house stuff, which is fine, Mary understood that there was something special about Jesus, and she goes and sits at the feet of Jesus. This becomes a social, like, stig- stigma situation. It's bad news. It's alarming. It's alarming. Why? Because when she sits at the feet of Jesus, she's declaring that she is... A disciple. A disciple. And Jesus is a rabbi. Mm -hmm. So disciples in this context are male. (laughs) Male disciples sit at the feet of a male rabbi. And all of a sudden you have a woman who sits at the feet of Jesus. You would think Hmm. that Jesus would say, whoa, hold up, wait a minute, Mary, love you. You have value and worth. I just need you to join your sister, Martha, in the back, right? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't. In fact, when Martha gets all upset about this, Jesus responds and he says, um, 
Uh, let me let me find this. Jesus, uh, Martha is distracted by much serving, and and she went up to him and said, "Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve her alone? Tell her then to help me." But the Lord answered her, "Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. And catch this: Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. He ev- he elevates." Hmm. Mary. Now, interestingly, later on, they have a brother. His name's Lazarus. Lazarus dies. And this is John 11, 17 through 27. And this is what I find a beautiful redemptive reversal. Because I don't know how Martha was feeling, but probably not super great when the Messiah basically rebukes her, right? Like, I missed that one, right? Jesus comes. And as Jesus comes, it's so intriguing that in this situation, Mary, it says that, but Mary remained seated in the house and Martha runs out to Jesus. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then Jesus, and Lisa, I want you to talk about this. Jesus says to her, what is so alarming, what is so unexpected, what is so um, fantastic, and you would expect him to say it to Mary, who got it right in the first instance, but he says it to Martha. He says this, Mary, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she says, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Yeah, because of old Peter, isn't it? Ain't the it? earth of Christ. Yeah, and I, I think you would expect, maybe even beyond him to say that to Mary, you, you would expect him to say it to someone who could multiply that message out and wow. who was allowed to multiply that message out. And so when he, which of course would be the men, yeah. right? But when he says, you know, Jesus only gave the seven I am statements in the book of John, right? I would fight that this is one of the most important, mm. if not the he most important. Be, yeah. And so for him to declare to Martha that, he is the resurrection and the life. To me, that speaks to her value, that she is a woman and that Jesus is okay with her multiplying that message out to speak what she has experienced from Christ. And before anybody's like, well, is that just a one-off? Is this just a random moment in scripture? Uh, no. We talked about Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, Luke 10, 39. You've got John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman. That it says, The text says that it was necessary. Jesus had to go through Samaria, which for a Jew going through Samaria was one of the most like un um uh what would you say like uncool, it, uncool don't do it and like rejected like you would never do this because yeah. if you encounter it was Samaritan, almost like from the Jewish standpoint it was forbidden it was forbidden yeah. like you because you'd if be you, unclean you'd be unclean exactly and here's a Samaritan who's a half breed half Jew half Gentile and Jesus sits and drinks water with her at the well and 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 then commissions her she goes back in and tells uh, of this Messiah um, they're the women at the resurrection um, and before you get to the women at the resurrection you've got the women who stay at the cross Matthew 27 and John 19 Mark 15 you've got this overwhelming presence of these women in Jesus's earthly life and ministry. But Lisa, one of the ones that I think is so incredible is that in Luke 23, 27 through 31, we've got the names of, of these women, right? But then Luke specifically says this, that there were many other daughters of Jerusalem. And then Mark 15, 41 says, and there were many unnamed women they were at the foot of the cross as Jesus, the Son of God, is dying. And I think what this does is it speaks to the ministry and to the life lived of Jesus, of honoring, cherishing, and championing women. Why else would a slew of women, a crowd of women, when the disciples, the male disciples are nowhere to be found, why would they be the ones to be at the cross? I think it speaks to how seriously Jesus loved and cherished and valued and elevated women in a culture that would have looked at him like he was crazy. And to bring it back to the Imago Dei as we wrap up, the image of God, it must be, Joel, that women shine a very specific and unique light on part of the reality of the image of God that is unique to a woman, just like a man must shine a unique Mm -hmm. light Mm -hmm. on the image of God from a man's 
vantage point from from a, a man's makeup. And so while we would never want to devalue a man, we certainly don't want to devalue a woman who is made in the image of God, because I dare say one of the biggest reasons that we lose out is that we are devaluing part of the image of God. Yes. And that's something we should never do. Now, imagine this, Joel. Imagine if that Samaritan woman, who really, if you look at it, that's the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. ministry. So she is the first evangelist, right? right? <laughs> so imagine if the Samaritan woman had stayed silent. Imagine if Martha had stayed silent. Imagine if Mary had stayed silent. Imagine if they had stayed silent, what we would have all lost out on. Imagine if they would have stayed silent, and why would you ever want them to? And that, my friends, is a good place to Mm. land this episode of Therapy and Theology. (laughs) 